Thank you, everybody, for joining from wherever you're at today. Um, I really do hope the session will be uh, valuable for you all. Uh, I'm actually really looking forward to uh, this particular talk. I look, I look forward to all these talks, but uh, quite honestly, I've had such great time preparing for this. And actually, I'm a user of this tool, so I'm a fan of uh, actually what we're going to talk about in many different ways, both uh, their use of temporal and uh, the tool that Descript actually provides. And We'll get into a little bit more about what the script does in a, in a second. So with that, I want to uh, invite our guest, Nathan, on. Nathan, you want to come on video? Yep. Hey, Jim. Good morning. Good morning, Nathan. Morning. Uh, um, so everybody, this is uh, Nathan Wesley. Nathan is an engineer at uh, the script. Uh, has been there for a while and is pretty well versed in their use of temporal. And well, if you don't know what Descript is, we'll get into that a little bit. But Nathan, you want to just give a quick overview or just quick introduction of yourself? Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks, Jim. Um, again, my name is Nathan Wessling. I'm a software engineer at Descript. I work on a team within Descript called the uh, Service Platform Team. So we're responsible for a lot of the infrastructure, um, a lot of the kind of uh, developer acceleration, making it easier for folks to build stuff, uh, but notably not really solely responsible for building out temporal workflows. That's something that we've distributed throughout the company. Yeah, but you're pretty well reversed in the in the topic. So, uh, yeah, all this will be a pretty good conversation because I think you have kind of both the development side and um, you know some really great expertise on the deployment side, which I think some of the the, the nuance there is actually pretty awesome. So. Um, I'm a fan of the tool. Uh, I don't know if everybody here on the on the on the call knows what Descript is. I would implore, I would encourage all of you to go check it out. But Nathan, what is Descript? Just to set the baseline here. Yeah. Um, so Descript is a video editor uh, primarily. Uh, it also does audio editing. It's in fact it started its life as like a, more of an audio tool, uh, very popular for podcast editing, but has grown into a full featured video editor. Um, Compared to maybe more traditional video editors like Final Cut Pro, which tend to be geared towards professional use, where you're managing multiple tracks and timelines and that type of editing, uh, Descript is aimed at being much more accessible to just everyday people. So rather than editing in timelines, the, 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 the paradigm is to uh, upload your video, automatically have it transcribed, and edit the video through the transcription. So if you don't like a sentence you said, you can delete it in the text and it will delete it in the video. Um, there's a bunch more features we've you know, added onto that, but that's the the gist of it for the product. So yeah, you, that's a great kind of uh, non-emotional overview of Descript, quite honestly, Nathan, but I'll give you a, I don't know y'all, I've been using Descript for about the past couple of months. I absolutely love the thing. I think it's just rad. Um, being able to upload a video, have it uploaded in seconds, having a transcription there immediately that you can copy paste and pull from. Um, they have like things like simple buttons where you say, just remove all the ahs and ums from my video and it just goes through and removes all that. And like, it, it just super amazing, dude. Um, and the fact that I can actually go and actually remove, like you go into the transcription editor and you just like take out a sentence and it's gone from the video, dude, it's just, it's awesome. And then, uh, I'm a, I'm yeah, a fan. I, I think for sure <laughs> the goal is to make it like uh, 10 times easier to create 10 times better video. So like you said, the filler word removals, your ums and ahs. Um, there's the ability, if you, I just said, um, you can strip that out in the script later. But if you, <laughs> uh, we knew uh, that joke was going to come in here somewhere, Nathan. Exactly. Um, uh, if you wanted to add spacing, for example, too, we have features called uh, uh, room tone where we'll capture what's the background noise so it doesn't sound like the stark background change as you've added uh, added space. Um, I'd say probably one of the most magical features is our AI voices where you're able to type in uh, text and have it read in your voice. Yeah, the countless times that I forgot to say something uh, is now fixed. I don't have to re-record an entire video. You simply go in, write the sentence, uh, and it, almost in real time, Nathan. I mean, it takes yeah. seconds for that to actually happen, right? Like, I mean, yep. I'm typing sentences. It's basically in the video. Yep. It, it's not real time, but it's pretty close, right? Yeah, within seconds. Yeah. yeah. And uh, y'all, go on, Nathan, please. So I, I also say that um, 
maybe the approach to editing video is different, but I guess the target user is pretty different too. So the That's use right. cases that we've seen a lot of attraction with is, uh, for example, uh, companies creating internal education videos. So you, you, you don't necessarily want to have to hire a video editor to tweak those. It's something that we do internally within even our platform team when we're wanting to share an announcement of a new way something's being done. Yeah. We'll record a video of it, remove the filler words, uh, clean it up a bit. Uh, you, nice feature related to this too is when you share these videos, you can share it through Descript where the transcript is uh, comes with the video. So you can do things like search the transcript to be able to jump to exactly where you want within the video. I, I think well, for just communication sharing, it's um, much easier. Yeah, it's it's pretty awesome, dude. And honestly, then I take transcripts and I dump it into like Google Gemini and I get summaries and like you guys, yeah, there's just so much you can do with AI these days. And so uh, there's just really amazing stuff. And so, um, but we talked about like kind of the speed at which these things happen, the reliability of an upload, like this all happens pretty quickly, which lends me into kind of like, okay, the reason we're talking, Nathan, is there's a lot of temporal underneath the covers here, right? Like how are you guys kind of just, I guess at a high level, how y'all using temporal today? Yeah, we use it a lot for a lot of the asynchronous work that goes on uh, within the app. Um, I'll say it goes back uh, November uh, 2020 was when Descript first started using Temporal. Uh, I think at the time, the Go SDK was the only one available. Um, and where we were at was we already had a asynchronous workflows for doing the transcription. And the typical paradigm we used was uh, through the API, post onto a rabbit queue, have a worker that reads from the rabbit queue, does the work, sends it back. And that was fine. Um, but what we were introducing around this time, so around four years ago, was the AI voice. And at the time, it took about 24 hours to train uh, the model for your specific voice mm -hmm. to be able to type and have it say what you want in your voice. Uh, it would require about a 30 minute for you to provide a 30 minute passage of reading, right? So there's this very time consuming step that hundreds were being done a day and how we were going to productionize that. It was more, much more complicated than what, um, what we had already done with asynchronous work using Rabbit. So that's what got us looking around for what's a better way to coordinate these long running tasks and uh, started using Temporal for that. Um, yeah, funny enough, since then, yeah. we've gone on to replace the transcription approach with Temporal and are able to take it and make it even faster by chunking the transcription and doing it in parallel, recombining it and um, processing it that way. Yeah, on the transcription side, so like on the initial upload, I mean, there's a whole process, right? It's upload the video, it's storage, it's basically understanding it, it's the transcription like jumps in and starts doing that, right? There's like a, I presume there's like a workflow that kind of manages that. Yep. When you do things like chunking up the video, it, are each one of those things, like each kind of process of the transcription processing its own like child workflow? Like, do you know how that works, Nathan? Yeah, so, uh... We we definitely have we we will start a parent workflow, uh, wait for the asset to be uploaded. Typically, mm -hmm. we'll have stripped out the audio from the video because it's like lighter weight, easier to process. Um, once that's once we have a signal uh, that the file has been uploaded, then we will start a child workflow that loops over the duration of the video, creates it in chunks and runs activities to send off to a, a third party to do the transcription. Uh, and then we have a process uh, called alignment where we have to match the, the uh, words with, with the audio, say where exactly it falls so that as you're playing it, it matches up. And then we have a final after, after all of those have completed, which is just written in a workflow, uh, we have an activity that recombines them and outputs the result. That's pretty awesome. Um, and so, uh, I mean, for large file processing of any type, I think you guys have some unique things because of like, yeah, the alignment piece and that sort of thing. 
Um, this is a pattern that I see a fair amount of where people are actually using workflows to do this sort of thing in a more kind of like reliable way. Um, at the top level though, too, you know, you and I spoke about this, like, I mean, uploading a video, anything can go wrong, right? Like stuff goes wrong all the time, right? Yeah. Um, definitely. I think the ability to handle retries and stored state within Temporal is one of the big advantages so that we don't really have to worry about that kind of plumbing and can instead, I think for any startup, being able to focus on your business logic is just going to uh, ensure your success so much more yeah. than if you have to like worry about building what essentially Temporal is providing. Right. Yeah, and you, you and I were talking about this kind of like, okay, because y'all, you can use the Descript, you can use Descript via web browser, but there's also a Descript app that you kind of run on your desktop or whatever, you know And I mean? So like, I think I use the desktop version of it actually, Nathan, I like it a lot actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, y'all like, I don't know, sometimes videos take a while to upload. You could, and I don't know, people close their laptops all the well, time because yeah, whatever, right? Is, yeah. Exactly. Like um, the, these, if you're uploading a like, 30 gigabyte video, which we'll accept, uh, it's it's common for uh, people to walk away or their computer runs out of power or whatnot, and it hasn't fully uploaded. We already know that they're intending to upload it, and we have everything saved in our temporal workflow kicked off, waiting for that to finalize. But when the customer comes back and like opens up the app again, the app also knows that they were in the middle of uploading. We'll resume it. When that completes, we'll uh, pick up where we left off and complete it for the customer. And is the resume just a simple kind of signal to the workflow to wake up from the client? Um, from yeah, from, well, the, from the client, it will just uh, continue uploading to our uh, ah. box storage. And when that completes, we our our workflow is pulling that and we'll right detect that it's completed and proceed. Yeah. So the workflow is more monitoring kind of the file location and kind of like uh, updates in some directory somewhere, whatever. Yeah, right. So in the blob storage, I guess. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So I think that's where it starts. And then there's a whole bunch of things that happen, right? So we talked through what? I mean, that's like two or three workflows we just touched on, right, Nathan? I mean, oh, yeah. there's a world of other stuff going on at, at Descript as well. Right? Yeah, I looked at it. And I mean, that was that one four years ago was the first workflow that we integrated. I looked the other day and we had uh, almost 50 workflows running now. Um, there's similar workflows as the transcription, which will chunk and then so so they can um, handle the work faster. That the, the example would be for our exporting functionality, right? Large video and you want to break it up into the sections uh, and parallelize that work. Um, but then uh, an uh, example, for, like for example, um, uh, we, we have some newer AI-based uh, features like an AI green screen. So typically if you wanted to remove your background in the old days, you'd put a green screen behind it and that was easy to detect and like allow you to replace the background. But with newer tools, you're able to do it without having the green screen. So it's artificial green screen. Um, that that runs as a temporal workflow. Um, we have a eye, eye correction feature where if your eyes are wondering, you're able to uh, turn on the turn on the feature, and it will. Uh, that one just freaks me out. I'm sorry, dude, but like, quit staring at me. It is, it is. Yeah, it can be. It can be a <laughs> lot. Yeah, I've um, seen that. Yeah, yeah, but you, I'm saying, you, so there, are, there are these kinds of AI features. Oh, uh, kind of some maybe two other uh, workflows, um, or at least uh, like we we mentioned the kind of overdub before this idea right. of missing a word, but there's a cool, pretty new feature uh, called regenerate, where if like one of your words just didn't come out quite well, you can fix what it says and then just say regenerate and it will, you know, take a pass over the word and uh, try to make it uh, sound better. So that's there, cool. Yeah, I'd say there, Go on. Besides these AI features though, I'd say out of this like 50, a good dozen or two are all around just, um, uh, sending emails, so transactional emails when customers are signing up or sending comments to each other. Uh, we so so fifty sounds big, but I'd say like a, a good chunk yeah. of those are are email based. 
Well, it's pretty important. I mean, like, yeah, like email stuff is also really important. We find this all the time. People use this for like these weird things that like, like, you know, that are very apropos to your business, but there's stuff that's like very general, like marketing email workflows that actually kind of need to just work guys uh, and doing that in code. It's, it's kind of a nice way of doing it. I'm interested in like the, like let's take for instance, like the recalibration or something like this, like something like that, Nathan. Um, from a development point of view, like what's the impact of using a workflow versus just basically trying to do that without temporal? Okay. Do you have any right. sense of like yeah. what that uh, is? I, I I mean, I think that the, the for a lot of these workflows, um, the ones that are mainly just doing like inference from a model, um, mm -hmm. it's it's not that much different from using a queue. But the reason why you'd want to use the queue or temporal compared to just doing it in your API request is uh, often two factors. Um, often what you're doing the inference in is in a language that might not be what your HTTP server is running. So we use a lot of uh, TypeScript, uh, Node.js, uh, you know, front end, or not front end, but the back end, uh, the, our, our, our HTTP servers. And then behind the scenes for the model inference run a lot of Python. So there's that, Disconnect. You could, but you could make a HTTP call from your HTTP service to the backend uh, Python code. But the other aspect that you have to guess look out for is the time that these take. And the longer it's taking, the more appropriate it feels to uh, handle it asynchronously. Whether it's a queue or temporal, uh, just um, not keeping a ton of open connections in place. Um, you, you accept it and then return back. I say like for in communication back to uh, the the clients, we rely heavily on uh, a solution called PubNub, which once our service is aware that it's completed, whether it's through a queue or temporal, we can trigger the message to the client through 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 PubNub. So, yeah. yeah. And is there any sort of like um, like impact on kind of like the, like the overall flow, right? Because there's like a lot of things going on within this. I mean, Nathan, it's pretty complex what you all are doing, right? Like, so um, I just inserting something like that. Is it just like a top level workflow thing or is this kind of a separate process? You know what I mean? Because like, I often think about like, you know, I, I love it when customers come to us to say like, oh, we just showed the business, the workflow now, and they kind of get what's going on. They don't have to like look at the code to really understand, right? So like inserting something like recalibration, I mean, is this just like, I, you know, I guess, is it, I'll just, I'll, I'll see the question. Is it easier to talk about it as a group, uh, both within engineering and beyond? I, I, I mean, I think so, because once folks are up to speed on using Temporal, it does let them focus more on the business logic. So yeah. they're not really worried about so much of the plumbing. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, don't, I didn't mention this before, but one of, for us, the most valuable aspects of using Temporal is the UI that it provides. So being getting insight into what all is running, what its states are, what's completed, opening up specific examples of workflows and seeing the kind of uh, each step that it goes through. Yeah. Super logic. How how do you guys use that information? Like you know, the, the insight uh, into the workflow execution a, itself. A lot for operational support. So when things break, it's super common. We have alerting in place for a given workflow error rate, for example, or latency threshold. Um, for error rates, especially, it's super easy just to open up the uh, temporal console, filter by that workflow, filter by failed, and sample a handful if if it's a major issue sampling a few should identify it really quickly yeah so identifying problems as far as we, we hear people using workflow execution histories to like uh actually debug like we'll hear like an operations person sending to development like hey you may want to look at this line of code because x y and z like yeah. when was the last time you ever see that you know uh oh, sure. yeah, phenomenal yeah. helpful yeah well, also, I, you know, it's like the, it ends up being like this, like a corpus of your business. Like you, basically everything that's going on is in this history. And it's not just like the, the, it's not like the, each transaction. It's not like the, 
you know, it's not like, oh, this pod's working or not. No, it's like, what's going on inside yeah. the thing yeah. itself, right? Which is, I think, yeah. super, super helpful. So. Yeah, it's geared more around, like the, the workflows themselves, the history of them speak more to what the business logic that was run was than the infrastructure layer. It's not just, right. yeah, the CPU or memory. Do you guys customize anything in the way that you kind of name workflows or in how you kind of organize stuff to make the discovery of things uh, better within the UI and to look at workflow execution histories? You, I, I don't know if you know or not. Nathan. Yeah. Kind of uh, watching, but... I, I think it's, um, I, I, uh, I'll i say in naming of workflow, naming, they, what they say about naming, right? It's like one of the two hard things in computer science. Um, uh, and I, 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 I think that what would have been, so, so I definitely think that naming well is going to make your system less complicated, easier to manage. So I think it's yeah. super important. We didn't, and it's probably one of the biggest regrets. If I could go back and change something, it would be setting some clear standards for how things would be named. Um, just to me, it like, yeah, when you, when you have, uh, a mix of camel case and snake case and capitalized first word or not, and the, uh, workflow prefix or not, or suffix, uh, yeah. it tends to make it really hard when you're trying to look something up quickly because you just have to try a variety of them or always checking back. And if you had a consistent naming, it would help a ton. So, so yeah. I think it's important. I wish we do it. I recommend everybody when you start using it to have a more opinionated stance on what your naming should look like. Yeah, I, I might follow up with you and ask you a couple of questions on that. I would love to post something like that to our blog or something, Nathan, because I think it's one of these things. I'm sorry. Just you talking about that had my OCD going crazy, dude. Like I'm absolutely insane about naming because um, it actually becomes really, really important. That is how you find things, right? So, yeah. and I don't think it's something that people really get. They start using temporal and they're just like, I don't know, haphazard. They're like, it's just, they're trying to learn the thing, let alone yeah. kind of figure out long term what the. How and it's also it, yeah. yeah, it's a kind of thing where people can feel very strongly about one way of naming versus the other, but no one's always going to agree. So, uh, I, yeah. If everyone could just agree that a standard approach for your company is going to be better than um, yeah. a, a hodgepodge. Ask our product team. I, I hold no like opinions on names. I'm joking. Yes. I'm actually pretty opinionated on names. So um, yeah, it's pretty awesome. So um, so we, we also talked about, you know, um, you know, you started off, it was kind of like one use case, a couple people using temporal. Yeah. Fast forward to today, there's a fair amount of people within Descript using temporal. I mean, geez, you're part of a platform team that's managing, right? Like, so what? How? what is the depth of kind of usage now? So four years ago or so when we started, there were, I looked it up uh, around uh, around 20 engineers at the company. So it's pretty small, uh, probably like less than a half dozen actually working on the back end. Yeah. Um, now there's at least six various teams uh, working on temporal themselves. So like we went from fewer than six people working on it to more than six teams working on it in this time. So yeah, it's definitely uh, definitely caught on. Yeah, and six teams, that's a lot of engineers. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, what do you got? Like 10 person teams, eight person teams, something yeah, like this. Right. It's pretty, it's pretty, yeah. Yeah, how do they learn temporal, Nathan? Mm -hmm. How does that work? That's a good question. Um, the there's a few a few a few approaches one like we have at this point yeah with 40 50 ish workflows there's a good number to look to but still folks since it's kind of always we're always building on our best practice of the use case uh our best yeah uh, we're, we're always improving what we consider to be the best practices within the company so um we maintain an example project that folks could copy from mm -hmm. with their, start their own um, we do a lot from the platform team, do a lot of counsel, consults with uh, various teams to kind of go over what they're thinking. We're involved uh, with a lot of the kind of trickier debugging and scaling uh, challenges that teams face. So we help out there. Sure. But, um, uh, but, but in large part, like for the core ideas of like, what is a workflow? What's an activity? What is a worker? Um, we, we, we point folks to the temporal documentation, which is great. Yeah. What's a, what's the biggest challenges for people, right? Uh, going through this process. Is it, yeah, uh, I think that it's, 
it's not so much challenges with temporal per se, but challenges with building distributed systems. Like yeah. that's the kind of hard thing. And temporal like, has one way of doing it. Um, and in general, so uh, I think things that people, they show, like you're often when, when, when new engineers are like learning temporal, they're also learning like say Kubernetes at the same time or learning like, I don't know, some of the uh, cloud platforms like intricacies. So, so there's just a lot of stuff that kind of comes bundled with it, uh, which makes right. oral seem kind of hard. Uh, but I'd say that like comparing, setting something up with temporal over setting it up with your own kind of RabbitMQ uh, or, or, you know, SQS or whatnot. Um, yeah. I'd say temporal is no harder and probably easier than that for just a basic setup. But then once you have a complicated system, one where you're doing lots of logic and you need to make sure that you're tracking state throughout and handling retries at every step that, that, so it's not that temporal is uh, easy or hard, but it makes pretty hard things significantly easier, if that makes sense. Like if, if something's going to be hard, you're going to get it a lot easier, but nobody's coming to us and saying, gosh, temporal is just so easy to use. I, I'd say it's as hard as anything else that you're building a distributed system with. Um, but that would have to do maybe with trade-offs that are like core to, uh, do you do you run something as a monolith or do you run right. it as microservices? There's benefits to either and temporal can be adapted to either. But right. um, that that that's more of what, what yeah I guess what, what's hard about it than yeah. using temporal as a technology. Yeah, I, I think you just got the tagline for our company: making difficult things easy. Yeah. I'm, I'm good with that. Like I'm 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 good with that. But I think it's right. Um, you know, so many times we see people just think of temporals like like you inherit scale, you inherit this resilient nature of like these services, right? Like you don't have to code for any of these things. Like a, we have a person on the team here and says like temporal allows you to code like you're in college yeah which i always find like a really good statement it's kind of true dude. like i don't know they give you a task you don't have to worry about like failed queues and yeah. i don't know weird database failures and regional outages and uh, you know the chaos that could happen you know i think that's the i think that's the beauty in fact i think if temporal was around 15 years ago i'd probably still be coding because like i just hated dealing with all this crap so sorry scott it's not a sweet, I, I can say that word on TV. Sorry, everybody. Um, so, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this in prep, Nathan. Uh, and by the way, if anybody, if there's any questions, please do ask questions. That hasn't been too many. Um, this is a pretty straightforward use case, actually. It's pretty awesome, actually. Um, what are some of the tips and gotchas you got for adopting yeah. Temporal? Yeah, I, okay. Um, so one is, uh, let's see. So bear with me on this one. Right. Yeah. One of the great things about Temporal is the metrics. Like getting yeah. um when we were using like our hand-rolled cues, right? We would instrument each use case, we'd like create our metric for it, and there would end up being inconsistencies, and one would report a certain way versus another. They would get renamed, they would get like deactivated. It was really hard to manage when there was just like a metric for every use case. What's been awesome with Temporal is having like all of your workflows emit a common metric and it tells you like, did it work or not? So we were able to set a like baseline alerting to be able to say, we're upholding some level of uh, uh, availability without like hardly any work. We just create the alert. And, and that's been super helpful. Um, but Temporal's alerting and met sorry, metrics that we alert on kind of fall into two buckets for, for, for availability. It's like it succeeded or it failed. And right. what we know is that like there's cases where um, maybe there's more ambiguity than that. So like if your workflow uh, does some validation and the content that was given to it is um, like a file and you download it, and it's not the right format, then it's kind of ambiguous. Should you say that failed or did that succeed? But it was like, you have to return a response saying that it's not good, like not, not valid yep. content. So, so originally we were like, okay, this is great. We're using these uh, metrics and we have such great coverage now, but we run into situations where 
it's unclear. If we fail to, like if we, if we took that validation example and considered it a failure in temporal, then we couldn't distinguish it from actual bugs that we need to respond to, right? So, and then if we, which, which we want to be, like we want to keep that noise away from like the actual things that are internal errors. If we return right. it and say, it's all good, then we need to write our own like metric that's going to say, well, actually it's a user facing validation error. That's important to know, but we don't want to mix it up with the, you know, the, 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 um, uh, server availability, like, yeah. right. Yeah. So, so, yeah. We, so, so we kind of just sat with like using the metrics cause it's fine. And then said, well, why don't we use it since we, since this is, we don't, we have this one problem. Let's create a child workflow, right? And after the validation, we'll kick off the child workflow. And then we'll just alert on that one. We won't alert on the parent one. And it was a way to kind of hack a solution, which um, worked, except that as you keep doing that multiple times and new, new employees are coming in and they're like, what's the reason for why you have these two? And they say, oh, it's, you know, it was just the easiest thing. And it ended up having like, more operational support burden by doing it this way. So, Interesting. okay. So that's the kind of like the, I'd say a gotcha would be using the things that temporal makes very easy and, and then misusing temporal to like get what you want. What we yeah. ended up doing, which is my recommendation now is to uh, temporal as a maybe more advanced feature than just using a workflow, which is to create your own custom in workflow interceptors. So we have like standard errors created now, which is in our business logic, Temporal doesn't care about like, like our validation or doesn't know how to, how to categorize it. We have our own custom error validation and we have a interceptor that when it receives those, it will emit a metric that is mm, more nuanced than what Temporal offers and lets us do the alerting we want with keeping it a simple flat yeah. workflow structure. Yeah. It's really interesting because I think the way that, you know, I think the way that Max and Sommer kind of architected what we do is we didn't want to get into the data that was actually inside the execution itself, right? Like, let's leave that to the consumer to use that information how they wanted to do that. And using this pattern, you're able to extract things that I think are useful in the context of observability or, or whatever it is that you've got to do. It's like, you know, let's not over-architect it to make people do things a certain way. I think what Max and Sommer did was like, let's make it so that it's amenable yeah. to all the ways you want to do it. And this is a really good pattern. If anybody's trying to figure out how to do this within Temporal, I think it's a, a really important one and yeah, useful. I, so like what we get is the ability to have like by default, if you're using our wrapper Temporal worker, you get uh, our internal classifications of errors in a metric mm -hmm. that no one else has to worry about inconsistencies because no one else is like writing their own metric, but it's customized to us. And the yeah. way that we were able to do that so easily is by using Temporal's interceptors. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. So uh, it's, it's an undervalued feature, I think sometimes, dude, uh, it's pretty important. So yeah. Um, I, Nathan, I know you're kind of more on the you know, the platform side of things, but I mean, you get into the design of how these things work. You kind of understand workers and kind of how that works within the team. Um, there was a good question, actually. Somebody asked like, how do you think about, or how do you developers kind of go about thinking about the granularity of the activities that are contained within a workflow? Do you guys have any kind of like theory on how you think about that? Or is it kind of like left to each developer to sort out? I mean, I think that, so the, I think, I think there's there's some practical limitations on like the number of activities you can run within the workflow, but I'd say it's largely uh, like the benefit temp Temporal's workflows give you is the ability to essentially like checkpoint the progress that you've made over time, and that uh, if you as it like re, you know. Um, as the as the workflow resumes its work, it doesn't have to uh, repeat things steps that have been made previously. So right. anything that's like like if if for if for example everything's done in an activity and your activity fails, then you're going to have to start that over from scratch. But if you've 
broken it up into activities. And you can think of that as checkpoints along the way so that if you have a failure, you uh, have the results saved in temporal state for all the progress that you made so far. That's so I'd right. say it's a kind of a, a, a matter of like um, thinking about at what level you'd expect something if it if it succeeds in storing it away and if right. it um yeah as opposed to having to redo all of that work but but it's i think really it's is. so dependent on the specific case i don't know that there is a general rule for it i i know there's not a general rule because i've seen all different ways uh and i think actually development teams end up kind of working together and you all kind of get a single it's almost hive mind within a development team uh, we often see it like across different teams there's different approaches uh but often in smaller companies, it's like a company thing. Um, we are doing questions. So I just wanted to, you know, everybody like I, I, I'm kind of going through the questions right now, Nathan. Um, kind of related to this is somebody was asking, and uh, this is a fairly straightforward, but, you know, when you're making async calls to an external service, like how does that work within Temporal? Like how would you design the, the that? I mean, it's pretty simple, right? Pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, so you, from the... Uh, from your HP service, you are um, starting a workflow, which looks like just a calling a function on your uh, temporal client, SDK client. But um, what it does is it saves the uh, input parameters to your workflow to temporal, mm -hmm. temporal cloud for managing you know, the backend. We don't run our own temporal, but all of the workers are run by, you know, uh, like we, 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 and I think in general, people run workers that do the actual work. We, but we post that there's an event to Temporal that puts it into a queue, the task queue concept within Temporal. And then workers that we manage will pull for that and pick up the work. And, you know, uh, Temporal orchestrates kind of the kind of saving of state for the workflow and making sure that it's, you know, routed correctly. and. Right. Within, the, within the SDK, it handles all of the uh, em emitting of metrics. Yeah. Yeah, and I, we, we see this all the time. And I don't know, there's countless workflows. Somebody actually asked a follow-up, you know, do you have, you know, asynchronous calls to external, you know, vendors? Like, you know, we have people like wrappering Stripe calls for payments. Yeah. We have people doing all these things where you're basically just wrappering the API within an activity so that if that thing, is, it, it could be a blocking call. That thing can time out. Like, what do you do in that context? Are you just retrying it, right? Like, and I think that's just yeah. the nature of temporal. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I think important, well, two, two points on that. One, just in terms of like, how do we use temporal? How do you make the request? One of the key features that I think makes it really easy to use is the fact that you have like typed parameters, at least we're using TypeScript, the TypeScript SDK predominantly and having type parameters for reading in and reading out just makes it feel like you're not even doing anything remote. It makes it feel like you're just writing local code. So, um, right. yeah, um, uh, sorry, what was the second thing you were just saying? Cause I had another, I don't know, man, I was just talking about rapper and APIs and like, you know, I mean, look at like they, they, they fail yeah. APIs oh, fail all yeah. the time. We would love exactly. for them not to fail. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'd say like, um, you know, example, I mentioned the email use case, like, why do we even bother if the call to write, uh, to make a post to an uh, email provider is super fast. Why even bother? Uh, and then instead we put temporal in place of it, uh, you could predominantly this is because the email provider can fail and then we lose the right. transaction, right? Um, and we wanted to save it and make it more reliable. Folks could say, well, you're just replacing one bot, like one point of failure for another and temporal can fail too. But I think the reality is we haven't had problems with temporal failing to accept these requests over the four years we've been working with you, but we've had many examples of X, Y, Z, email provider uh, having outages. So I, I think that like, yeah, it's a lot of the, yeah. uh, the the value of Temporal is that the backend seems rock solid and we're able to hand off the work without worrying about Temporal's availability. Yeah. And we spend a lot of time thinking about this internally, Nathan, like, especially because we offer, you know, like there's two parts here. If people don't understand, I mean, there's basically the SDK and workers within your application and it's communicating with the, server that manages states and understand where you're at. And that server has to be reliable because that's what you're depending on. And so we spend a lot of time within the architecture of Temporal Cloud 
to ensure that that is a reliable service. Like, you know, we do things like we don't depend on other services in the back end. Is like is we we eliminate as much as we have to depend on other people as possible. Like we get as close to the metal as possible within AWS where we run things. Like we want to be as close to network storage and compute. Uh, that way, you know, because you are relying on us to do your business. You know, like companies like Snap, same sort of thing, right? Like, and it's um, it, it's we spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of time thinking about that. So, um, and so, but thanks for being a, a cloud customer. Um, yeah. There were a couple of other things in here. Um, I think here, let me just look through. Yeah, they were. I just somebody asked if you guys are using Temporal Cloud, and I just I spoke to that. Yeah, actually, I just be. I'll I'll read some other questions, but I'll ask you a question while I'm reading a couple of things. I'd like to multitask here, Nathan. Um, what was the kind of consideration to go to Temporal Cloud? Is it just you know like what was it for Descript? Because I mean, you could do self-hosted. This is all open source, y'all. Like you could download, do all this stuff. Like it's amazing. Um, but you guys chose to use the Temporal Cloud service. What what went into that that decision? I mean, I think it's just um, a, anytime when we can direct engineering effort toward our product and not towards just like yeah. more operational support, we would rather, we. I think it works. It's a, it's a, it's a better deal financially for us to have uh, you all manage that than for us to have to become experts in managing that. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. And then um, I think you guys are pretty active in the community too, right? Um, you guys use how, how do you guys use support? You're 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 in the community oh. doing things a whole lot, right? I mean, the support has been great. Um, one thing I mentioned to you earlier was uh, that there have been a few times where we thought that potentially there was a bug in Temporal, and uh, we would find workers that are not making progress, and we'd reach out. I'd say every time this has happened, we talked to uh, support. They've been super uh, responsive and helpful. And uh, every time help us discover there's a problem in our in our worker that was the root cause for why it wasn't um, why, why it got stuck. So I think it ends up maybe once you're at that level of debugging things that are um, both like you know we have over a hundred thousand workflows running a day. Yeah, weird things start to happen, and and it's helpful to have uh, the the um, support team there to help dig into those like more unique types of errors. Um, but but I'd say we also uh, back, um, you know, when I first joined, we had, because we were pretty early adopter of Temporal, we had a Slack channel that was like Slack support um, where we could just ask questions. And yeah. one of the things that I always uh, was super impressed with, so I think my first two questions that I asked on that channel were both answered by Maxime. So yeah. to have like a CEO of a company, you know, be like providing the support, the technical support for these like questions, it was uh, very impressive. Yeah, I'll say, um, I think our most prolific and active support member of our team is actually Max. Uh, mm -hmm. The dude is just out there engaged in the community. Like I see things happening in the community because Max is forwarding them to me well before I'm even, I can't keep up like that. It's incredible. Um, I don't know. I think, I just think Max and Summer have like, you know, been focused on trying to solve this problem for so long that they're just, they're just into it, dude. And uh, I think once you see Temporal, you can't unsee it. Well, they, they're living it and they can't unlive it. I think is kind of one of those things. So so happy that that's the experience that you have, because honestly, it's one of the reasons I work here, Nathan, is because of this kind of level of, uh, I don't know, I don't, an attention to detail and care around mm -hmm. these sort of things. I think it's a, it's a unique problem set to solve and uh, a unique solution to do it. So like the script, actually. So um, with that, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll do my, my part. Everybody stay for a second. Don't leave just yet. One last thing I want to show you. Wait, there's one more thing. I'll Steve job this thing. Um let me just actually put this up here. So uh, just as a kind of going away, y'all, um, Nathan and team were uh, generous enough to kind of come with a with a, with a a code. So you can actually go use Descript. Uh, if you wanted to go and use this today, just use the code Temporal. And I think, you, what do you get for that, Nathan? Uh, you get a free month of the Pro account just to try out with the, the there's um, a lot looser restrictions on what's capable with the pro account. So you get to use it to its fullest capability for a month to see how you like it. 
It's awesome. I like it because, hey, man, it's going to show off the reliability of temporal because underneath this, y'all, everything that's happening, it's kind of like a bunch of temporal stuff going on. Um, I hate to give ads at these things, but like, honestly, I don't know, man, I love the tool. Like, I would love everybody to use this thing. So I don't know. I, I just I'm a I'm a fan. So well, thanks, um, Nathan. Seriously, thank you for doing this, dude. I thoroughly enjoyed all of our conversations leading into this. And most of all, this one. Um, thank you so much for doing this today. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. All right, buddy. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, like we said, a recording will be out there and available to everybody uh, relatively soon. Sorry, we went a little bit long. I don't know. These things are a half hour, but they end up being 45 minutes every time. So um, thank you for, for joining us today, everybody, on behalf of everybody at Temporal. So uh, have a great day. See you all.